Two years ago, the internet was set off fire with rage over the Netflix version of Neon Genesis Evangelion. The series had been out of print for years at that point, inaccessible outside of piracy and overpriced secondhand DVDs. When news broke that Evangelion would be available on one of the biggest streaming services in the world, all over the world, people were understandably excited. But when everyone sat down to watch that show that fateful morning in 2019, they discovered a bastardization of the series they held dear. A translation riddled with errors and stilted emotionless dialogue, paired with the sudden revelation that Netflix couldn't even bother to pay for the license to fly me to the moon. Accusations were hurled at Netflix for erasing the romantic undertones to Karu and Shinji's relationship by changing a confession of love to a confession of like. The entire situation was just a dumpster fire, a glorious and completely hilarious dumpster fire that I even uploaded a video about a few days after the debacle. A few days before that, I uploaded a video declaring the ADV dub worthy of my grace, and talking about my hope that the cast would return in some form, or that we'd have the choice to choose between the new dub and the ADV one. This seemed to be a sentiment that was shared between the fanbase. The ADV dub is fantastic, and the Netflix one is absolute unadulterated trash and should never be touched under any, and I mean any, circumstance. But is that really true? And what got us here? Evangelion is one of the biggest media marketing machines in Japan, yet went nearly a decade unavailable legally in the United States. I set out to help myself understand Evangelion's complicated history with the USA, and what I found went infinitely deeper than what I ever could have imagined. It's a story of mistranslations, misinterpretations, misdirections, million dollar film adaptations funded by Peter Jackson's, PBS, Cartoon Network, and Playstations. The story of Evangelion in the USA is one that follows the anime industry in America as it rises, falls, and rises again, with the longevity of the show lasting through multiple companies and generations of anime distribution. So join me as we explore the life, death, and rebirth of Neon Genesis Evangelion in the USA. Though quickly, I'd like to give a few disclaimers before we get going with the video. I'm only going to be focusing on the Evangelion series and the films when it comes to licensing, so nothing about the manga or anything else is going to be in here. This has been an independent project far greater in scope than anything else I've done before, and although I've given the utmost effort to intensive research, there will always be things I'll miss or a few things I may get slightly incorrect. I'll link my sources for this video in the description, so if you want to research more of the topics I cover here, you can. There are a few things I'm going to cover for this video that don't have the absolute best sources in the world, but I believe are still important to mention. I'll give disclaimers to those individually as I get to them. I do have a bias against certain choices made in the production of some things I'll be discussing here, but that doesn't make my criticism or opinions expressed objective fact. I'll try to clarify when something I'm saying is my opinion and when something I'm saying is objective information. And any criticism I give to anyone here is just that, criticism, and shouldn't reflect on who they are as a person outside of that. I don't advocate witch hunting or scapegoating of any kind. And with that, let's get into the video. <laughs> Our story starts in the early 90s in the city of Houston, Texas. One John Ledford owned a store and mail order service for imported Japanese video games named Gametronics, a company that he boasted as the second largest in the USA. One day, he connected with a man named Matt Greenfield, who ran a nearby anime club, and the two began discussing the market for anime in the USA. The pair realized that there was potential to expand in a way that no other company had attempted up until that point, with anime brought overseas typically being heavily edited and scarce in numbers. Less than a month after that conversation, the two founded AD Vision, soon to be shortened to ADV. Their first release was the Madhouse OVA Devil Hunter Yohoko, and the company would surely and steadily increase their output every year. Across the ocean, the Japanese anime studio Gainax was gearing up for its next big project. Hideaki Anno, at the time famous for Gunbuster and Nadia the Secret of Blue Water, was to create a mecha series with a relatively high amount of creative control. 
He pulled from his life experiences with depression to tell a dramatic story of self-realization, peppered with homages to science fiction and anime as a medium. This proved to be a concoction for a cultural sensation. It was an unprecedented amount of success for Gainax and Anno, but when the Houston-based ADV began negotiations to acquire the series, None of that had existed yet. When talks began to bring Evangelion overseas, the show hadn't even began airing, and although when the agreement was signed it was a few episodes into its run, no one could predict just how valuable the license would be. ADV reportedly paid $400,000 for the license to the original 26-episode television series. And although that might seem like a lot of money, when Manga Entertainment bought the license to End of Evangelion four years later, they ended up paying $2 million. ADV had paid practically nothing for what would become one of the most coveted anime licenses out there. We'll get to End of Evangelion later, but for now, let's focus on how they initially released the series. The English script was adapted by ADV co-founder Matt Greenfield, with the show itself presumably being translated by Project Translator Kuni Kimura. ADV were pumping out dubs as soon as the episodes reached their office, resulting in the voice actors having no prior knowledge of Ava's plot when reading their lines. On top of that, all of the voice actors recorded their lines individually, as opposed to in one room together, something that made it hard to emulate the dynamics of the original Japanese voice cast. Think of that story of Shinji's voice actor choking Asuka's voice actor. Nothing like that was emulated with the English voice cast. Not that I'm saying they should have choked each other necessarily, but you get what I mean. I've heard a common sentiment shared that the ADV dub gets better as it goes along, which is probably the result of the actors getting a better grasp on the characters as the story progressed. The script submitted for approval by Gainax went through a chaotic process, often with very little scrutiny leading to massive oversights being made in the original VHS translation. It made the show confusing, leading to plot details getting fuzzy and ambiguous, such as whether Rei was a clone of Yui or what the hell was going on in those last two episodes. Let's talk about that dub cast a bit. Some of the voice actors cast in the dub already had established relationships with ADV at the time, while some were just local to the Houston area. Tiffany Grant and Amanda Wynn Lee, as Asuka and Ray respectively, are two people who would go on to be prominent figures in the American fanbase. Although I think both voice actors did a fantastic job considering the circumstances under which this series was dubbed, I'm particularly focusing on them because they'll both become relevant to the history of this series in America later. Other members of the cast include Spike Spencer as Shinji, Allison Keith as Misato, and Tristan McAvery who I have a particular preference for as Gendo. The cast has become ubiquitous with the Evangelion characters in their own right, and many key members would continue to reprise their roles in the years to come. Although, as I grew up I came to prefer the Japanese voice actors, I can't deny that I still hold the ADV dub in high regard. Even if it's not your favorite performance of all time, I believe they did a pretty good job considering the source material they were adapting from. However, I will admit the show is riddled with inconsistencies with the original series, ranging from subtle mistranslations to egregious errors. I would go into all of them here, but truth be told, I lacked the knowledge of the Japanese language to truly do any of it justice. I recommend you check out The Mistranslations of Evangelion by Go Jesus for a much shorter video that delves deeper into some instances of this. It incidentally covers some of the same information that I do in this video as a result of the subject matter, but it does a good job expanding on a specific subset of this topic that isn't exactly in my zone. I would like to focus on two changes between the English dub and original Japanese audio that have less to do with the translation itself. These may not be massive issues to you, but they're things that I personally think detract from the experience. The first is in the final episode of the series, during its last moments. As Shinji is coming to the realization that he is in control of his own reality, breaking down instrumentality, he says the words, this specific line has an effect where it plays with multiple voices spread across the left and right audio channels. These are the voices of Shinji, Rei, and Asuka saying the line together, representing their shared realization synchronized in instrumentality. It's an incredibly subtle yet striking design choice that not only has a purpose behind it, but sounds really cool on headphones. 
This is completely absent in the English dub, opting for a standard echo effect that doesn't sound anywhere near as good in comparison. But maybe, maybe I could love myself. The second, I have a personal antidote attached to. My favorite episode of Evangelion is episode 22, Don't Be. I've always been in love with the way that it flushes out Asuka as a person, filling in the gaps of her backstory and making her previously bitchy attitude something sympathetic. It feels cinematic in a way the previous episodes couldn't accomplish, like a full realization of the tone of the show up until that point. Also, it's absolutely horrifying. Anyways, 19 minutes and 13 seconds or so into the director's cut version, we have a sequence of Asuka talking over reused footage from previous episodes. In the dub, she says, I'm Asuka, Asuka Langley Soryu. Charmed, huh? What are you, stupid? Now's my chance. Look at me, damn it! Look at me! The shot of Asuka yelling at Kaji distorts, and it cuts to Asuka holding herself and screaming. No! No, no, this is the real me! The scene then proceeds to repeat exactly like that five times. Now, you need to understand that 12-year-old me watching this for the first time was too distraught for seeing Asuka get her psyche absolutely demolished to question the fact that this series just did something comparable to the infamous elevator scene, which was literally in this episode, by the way. But upon my next rewatch, I just figured it was because of budgetary restraints. It became one of my favorite moments, though, and I was even able to jot down the dialogue she said entirely from my memory. So imagine my surprise a few years later when I watched the show with the Japanese voices and discovered that during each of the repetitions, Asuka was played by someone different. It's an absolutely brilliant way of describing Asuka's disconnection with herself that makes me love the scene even more. The choice to reuse old moments is probably to contrast with the original delivery of the lines, but all of that got completely omitted in the English audio. The dub is scattered with inconsistencies like this, and it can definitely lessen the experience in my opinion. However, that isn't to say it's absolutely terrible. People listen to dubs for countless different reasons, and if someone has poor eyesight for reading subtitles, or their eyes can't keep up with everything altogether, or even if they just prefer to hear something in their native language, I think that it's totally reasonable to prefer them. Yeah, I'm being a dub apologist, I really don't think it's that big of a deal in most cases. With the details about production and the dub out of the way, let's get into the nitty gritty of how ADV actually released this thing. ADV released Evangelion initially in 13 volumes on VHS. These were styled as Genesis Zero Colon Volume Number. Since VHS tapes only supported one audio track, both the dubbed and subtitled versions were released separately with a dubbed volume costing you $24.95 and a subbed volume costing you slightly more at $29.95. If you purchased a complete set of 13 tapes dubbed, it would cost you $324.35, and subbed, it would cost you $389.35. Expensive, I know. Each of these VHS tapes came with a small blurb on the box about the episodes contained on the volume. Genesis 1 read, Half of the world's population is dead. The human race has been driven off of the face of the earth. And only one force stands between mankind and total annihilation. Genesis 2 read, Fighting angels, plagued by demons. Mankind's fate is in their hands. Genesis 3, Conundrums and Confrontations. As the angels attack. Genesis 4, Walking Bombs, Aquatic Angels, and the PTA as a new warrior joins the battle. Genesis 5 introduced each volume having a name, with this volume being named Magma Diver, and the caption being Against the Angels in the Bowels of Hell. Genesis 6, The Day Tokyo 3 Stood Still, Buried Alive in an Underground Maze. Genesis 7, Invasion, Naked Against the Angels. Genesis 8, Lies in Silence, A War of Shadows. Genesis 9, The Fourth Child, Rampage. Genesis 10, Weaving a Story, Eaten Alive. Genesis 11, The Birth, The Dawn of a New Creation. Genesis 12, Ray 3, The Beginning of the End is Now, The Fifth Child Has Arrived. And finally, Genesis 13 was named A World Ending, with the caption, Final Genesis. The original ADV tapes began releasing on August 20th, 1996, and finished releasing on July 7th, 1998. Due to ADV pumping out these tapes as soon as they could finish the dubs, and these tapes not containing the Director's Cut episodes or End of Evangelion, they actually ended up releasing before they were on VHS in Japan. 
In between releasing these, ADV attempted to begin putting the series on the ill-fated Laserdisc format. Only two volumes were ever produced though, spanning eight total episodes. Each of these volumes were styled as Collection Volume Number Deluxe Edition, and featured the same artwork as the VHS tapes but larger. Although each of these Laserdiscs were more expensive than the tapes, running you $59.95 each, they actually both contained the English audio and the Japanese audio with subtitles. Now, this is a bit of a tangent, but I want to share a fun, or not so fun depending on who you ask, fact that I learned while researching for this video. The ADV Films Laserdisc releases were pressed by Sony DADC, a subdivision of Sony that specializes in the manufacturing of different discs. During the 90s, their Terre Haute, Indiana plant became infamous for producing batches of defective copies that would become unplayable due to disc rot. The Laserdiscs for Evangelion that were released by ADV were pressed by this plant and therefore are prone to this issue. Pairing this together with how quickly the releases were dropped by ADV, it's a safe guess that this has become quite a rare piece of Evangelion media. If one of you watching this happens to have one of these that's still working, you have quite the slice of history. Two years after the VHS releases concluded, ADV landed on the DVD format with what would become known as the Perfect Collection. These were styled as Collection Zero Colon Volume Number and were split up into eight different parts. These DVDs contain both the subbed versions and the English dub and would cost you $29.98 each or $239.84 for a complete set. Like the VHS tapes, each of the DVDs also came with a small blurb on the box about the episodes they contained. Collection 1 had the caption, A new world, a new technology, one last hope for salvation. Collection 2 is the same as its VHS counterpart. Collection 3, Against the Angels. Collection 4, Battle in Inner Space. Collection 5, Inner Sanctums. Collection 6, Berserk. Collection 7 didn't even get a caption for some reason, and Collection 8 had the caption, Final Genesis, like its VHS counterpart. The first volume in the Perfect Collection contained editing on behalf of ADV to reduce something known as the Gynax Stutter, a reoccurring problem in 90s Gynax series such as Evangelion and Karikano, there's my obligatory mention, watch Karikano, was a small jittering effect that would occur between cuts as a result of the studio using out-of-date equipment. This edit would only be on the first volume though, with subsequent releases leaving the stutter intact. In 2001, ADV would reissue the volume with the editing entirely removed, and a newly designed cover art that fell closer in line with the rest of the Perfect Collection. These DVDs were released from May 23rd, 2000 to June 26th, 2001, with a complete box set releasing a little under a year later on April 9th, 2002. This box set included subtly adjusted cover art for the second volume that fit closer in line with the rest of the DVDs. The box would also be released individually with no DVDs included or just the first volume, although these versions were only available for purchase through the Right Stuff International, a still active online anime store. In that same month, a second box was released known as the Paul Champagne box, also exclusively through Right Stuff. The DVDs were held in a metal box designed by Paul Champagne, thus its namesake. Only 2,000 of these were ever officially produced for market though, and it's since fallen into obscurity. So if you have one of these laying around, as with the laser discs, you have quite a rare slice of history. Something that's important to note again is that these releases lack both the end of Evangelion and the director's cut, therefore not being a definitive version of the series. I'm going to assume that if you're here you know what End of Evangelion is already, but since I met people who have seen the series but don't know what the director's cut episodes are, what you need to know is during the production of End of Eva and while the series was getting its VHS release in Japan, four episodes received new cuts that added additional scenes to tell a more cohesive storyline. Since the director's cut episodes were made after the series had initially concluded, ADV had to wait to acquire the rights. When they were secured, they released two additional director's cut volumes on January 13th and March 9th, 2004. These were each named Resurrection and Genesis Reborn, respectively, and sold for $29.98 each. Resurrection contained the original and director's cut versions of episodes 21, 22, and 23, while Genesis Reborn contained the original and director's cut versions of episode 24 and the normal versions of 25 and 26, since those episodes didn't receive any new additions. It took six years for these versions of the episodes to come over to America lately, which meant all of the critically important information that they added to the story was stuck in Japan for quite some time. Also, these DVDs actually had bonus features. 
I should have mentioned that none of the previous DVDs had any bonus features, unless you consider character bios and textless openings bonus features, which is like asking someone if they consider rotten bread and uncooked rice food. These bonus features relate to the currently unmade live-action Hollywood Neon Genesis Evangelion movie, which I'm going to have to give a massive, we'll get to that later. It's worth mentioning that the English dub was re-recorded for these episodes on the DVDs to accommodate new scenes being added in. This resulted in certain characters being recast as either the actor didn't want to work with ADV anymore, or they had just completely disappeared off the grid. The two most notable of these are Tristan McAvery as Gendo, who was replaced by John Swayze, and Kyle Sturdivant as Karu, who was replaced by Greg Ayers. Less than six months after the Genesis Reborn DVD released, ADV decided to just completely make them obsolete by beginning to release the Platinum Collection. These not only featured the Director's Cut episodes, but the entire series all in much better clarity than the Perfect Collection, with the audio getting a massive improvement also. Although the live-action Evangelion film bonus features weren't brought over, some new bonuses were thrown in like commentaries and featurettes produced by ADV. I like this one named That Little Red-Haired Girl, which is just Tiffany Grant, the aforementioned English dub voice of Asuka, showing all of her merchandise of the character. I like this single goofy-ass Shinji that she has also. The other one is called The Mythology of Evangelion, which features Matt Greenfield and quote-unquote Evangelion lecturer Sean McCoy discussing the deeper philosophical and symbolic layers to Evangelion. I was following along pretty well until Matt Greenfield said that all the episodes up until the last two are a flashback that took place inside Shinji's mind, and it may not have even happened. The entire series of Ava up to the last two episodes is actually a flashback, or a dream, or something to that effect. It's all actually taking place in Shinji's mind. Now, are these events that really happened, that he's going over and over again? Is this some kind of dream analog that he's come up with to represent his situation? We don't know, and ultimately it's really not important to understanding the show to know which it is. I understand that art is subjective, and he has his own opinion, and I have mine, and yada yada, but Jesus Christ, this is quite the statement to make. I watched quite a bit of this, and it seems to be leaning into the idea that Evangelion is some advanced multi-layered religious allegory, which the people who created this series have been rejecting for years. Considering that, it's pretty surprising that something like this was put on an official DVD, but what are you gonna do? I'm happy that the people involved in dubbing the show were at least passionate about it. Also, how exactly would I get the title of Evangelion Lecturer? Can I apply for that somewhere, or does making a video like this just grant me that title automatically? The Platinum Collection releases were styled as Platinum Zero Colon Volume Number, and were split up into seven different parts. No captions or anything this time, just slick artwork by Yoshiyuki Sadamoto. I do not condone his action. And this cloudy platinum effect. Each of these sold for $29.98, totaling to $209.86 for a complete set. Additionally, on top of offering a box similar to the Perfect Collection, ADV released what they referred to as Platinum Complete. This featured the DVDs in smaller cases, and stored in the compact box for $89.98. This contained all the same episodes spread across seven discs, but no extras, which makes it completely ironic that they would refer to this Platinum as complete. Boy, I sure hope someone got fired for that blunder. Additionally, again, in 2007, ADV released Platinum Perfect, which contained those smaller cases now stored in a collectible tin with extras intact. A perfect collection, if you would but apparently not perfect enough, because the next year they released the same shit again with a delectable holiday version. Apparently, ADV's idea of festive is ditching the entire platinum aesthetic that they have been building up for four years at that point to just put it in a standard DVD case. I'll admit, I'm a fan of how this looks though. This is the version of the platinum collection that I own because I found it for really cheap at a local bookstore. It's ironic to think that the Platinum DVDs could fetch such a high price secondhand nowadays when ADV released so many versions of them. If you're going to pick up any Evangelion home media, the Platinum collection would be the obvious choice if you're willing to shell out the cash. 
The subtitles were actually redone between the VHS releases, The Perfect Collection, and The Platinum Collection. The VHS and Perfect subtitles are pretty inaccurate and confusing, but I think the Platinum subtitles do a fine enough job to understand what's going on. In my opinion, it's the best official translation of Evangelion out there. After ADV's run with the license for 16 years, Neon Genesis Evangelion was reported to be going out of print on November 30th, 2011. Two years prior, ADV had liquidated and sold off all of its assets amid financial crisis in a bid to keep their business afloat. The Evangelion license was relocated to Section 23 Films, which would continue pressing the Platinum Collection into 2011. You see, the anime industry in America just wasn't what it used to be. In the good old days, you could get people to spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars on anime VHS tapes and DVDs. One of the articles I read about ADV mentioned stickers people would slap on their car that read, Anime, more expensive than drugs. In 2008, the world experienced a global recession. Everyone had a lot less money to throw around, and that included your anime DVDs. Simultaneously, platforms like YouTube were giving a meteoric rise to easy and accessible piracy. Now, you can criticize that kind of thing all you want, but if you're short on cash and want to watch your animes, what are you going to do? Buy a complete series for 200 or more dollars, or watch it for free on a site one Google search away? Companies like ADV were going to lose their grip on their audience until they could adapt to the changing landscape of anime distribution. I could dedicate a whole other video to ADV because they're absolutely fascinating to me. Definitely a fallen giant of the anime world. I'm not done talking about them and their antics with the Evangelion license yet because they managed to have an undercurrent throughout almost everything I'm talking about here. But let's switch from DVDs and focus on the times that Evangelion aired on television in the United States. The first place that Evangelion showed up on television may not be where you expect. I'm sure some of you are saying, oh yeah, I know this, it's Cartoon Network. Uh, wrong. You underestimate me, buddy. I'm a soon-to-be Evangelion lecturer. To learn where it really began, we have to travel back for the post-9-11 economic hellscape of the late 2000s to the dawn of a new millennium. In March of 2000, a San Jose-based PBS affiliate named KTEH 54 began airing Neon Genesis Evangelion. KTEH prided itself on picking up niche and obscure programming that wasn't usually targeted by other channels, which led to them venturing into the world of anime. This made them popular with local fans who would donate to the station, creating a healthy relationship that saw KTEH looking for new and unique anime to air. Not only did Evangelion air in its entirety on KTEH, but it aired completely completely unedited, and even subtitled. According to a blog post I was reading about the station, they hosted a poll during the Congruent Pledge event asking viewers how they believed the word Evangelion was pronounced. Although the writer doesn't say, I have to figure this was a battle between Avongelion and Avongelion. I still remain a huge believer in Evangelion, as you can tell. I understand that the word evangelical exists, but Evangelion just sounds stupid and icky and I don't like it, no sir, not one bit. Although this isn't exactly relevant to Evangelion, I think it's worth applauding KTEH for airing anime like this that wasn't exactly mainstream yet. I didn't live in California when Evangelion aired in March of 2000, nor was I alive, but I have to applaud the effort on the station's part to try to appeal to a niche audience. Other anime that aired on the station included Urusei Yatsura, Ramino One Half, Tenchei Muo, Sakura Wars, and most surprisingly of all, Serial Experiments Lane, which is honestly infinitely more shocking to me than Evangelion. Lane, one of the most interesting, most highly stylized uh, anime series we have yet been able to bring you. We have been in search of this series for two years. We have been trying and trying and trying to convince the distributor to let us have a crack at it, but until now they were unwilling. Well, finally they have come through and allowed us to show this to you, and that means this is its first time ever on television in the United States of America. We are proud to be continuing that tradition here at KTEH of never seen before on American television anime series, and this one we think is very important because we believe it's one of the best. 
In 2006, KTEH would merge with another station, bringing an end to their escapades into anime. While working on this video, I wasn't able to find any material relating to Evangelion on KTEH, so if you have anything or know where to find it, please leave a comment down below or get in contact with me. Moving ahead three years, Evangelion would reach a larger stage when it hit Cartoon Network in February of 2003. Now, you're probably imagining that something like Evangelion wouldn't be able to pass whatever content restrictions Cartoon Network had in place, and you'd be right. Evangelion Air dubbed in a heavily censored state and only showed two of its 26 episodes. In fact, I doubt it was ever even supposed to air past that because it only played once during a special event known as Giant Robot Week. This was a week on the Toonami block that celebrated the mecha genre by airing episodes of Evangelion, Robotech, Die Guard, Marsh's successor to Desco, and The Iron Giant, which I guess is a mecha if you think about it. Countless major changes were made to accommodate a network primarily aimed towards younger audiences some of which made sense and some of which seemed like much more trouble than they were probably worth. To list a few examples, 2 minutes and 42 seconds into the first episode when Shinji looks at the photo Misato gave him, you could see an arrow that she drew pointing towards her breasts. Excellent foreshadowing on Anno's part. In the Cartoon Network version, this arrow has been digitally removed to keep Shinji's pure soul free from lust. All of Misato's Ibisu beer cans have been changed to generic blue, presumably to remove references to alcoholism for the series. I have no idea if Ibisu beer is actually available in America, so this might be a pointless change, but I can understand why they do it. The absolute strangest edit made comes in the scene when Misato is in the bath. In order to make a woman's breast socially acceptable for a young mainstream American audience, they superimposed a swimsuit onto Misato, so she wasn't naked. Now, let's dissect this. First and foremost, who the hell is wearing a swimsuit in the bath? I guess the edits made to tone down anime for American audiences don't always make the most sense, i.e. Jelly, jelly donuts, donuts, but Jesus Christ, this is Evangelion we're talking about. You should have known what you were getting into in the first place. Second, why wasn't this scene just cut from the episode? They did cut out the shot that was very obviously fan service, but at that point, why not just cut the scene out altogether? The scene where Shinji was naked with the toothpicks was cut. The scene where Shinji sees blood on his hand from Rei was cut. The scene where Shinji was in the bath was cut, and that scene is way tamer than Misato's. It just baffles me they would go through all of this effort for something that arguably wasn't any more or less important than what they did remove. Overall, Giant Robot Week exists as an interesting event in the history of Evangelion. I'll admit, I've never seen One Piece, but the way that people describe the 4Kids version of that series seems similar to how this is. A more fateful broadcast of Evangelion came in 2005 when the series returned to Cartoon Network through its late-night programming block, Adult Swim. In my experience, this seemed to be the most well-known broadcast of the show in America, being a complete showing of the entire thing that seemed to garner quite a lot of viewership. Although the series aired all 26 episodes in succession, beginning in October 2005, it was dubbed and didn't come without any changes. Instances of swearing were bleeped out, and shots with explicit nudity, such as Shinji falling on Rei's breast in episode 5, were cut. One edit that I find fascinating was in episode 22, the one I mentioned earlier with the Asuka scene. The visual effects in this episode were apparently changed pretty dramatically, although I wasn't able to understand exactly what edits were made from the descriptions I could find. If I had to guess, I'd assume a sequence of the episode with rapidly flashing lights was changed in order to not trigger epileptic seizures, but every mention I found of this has been way too vague to perfectly understand. I wasn't able to track down copies of these episodes airing on Adult Swim, so as with KTEH, if you have any idea where I could find these broadcasts, please leave a comment on this video or get in contact with me. I'd be incredibly surprised if they weren't backed up somewhere I just couldn't find while researching for this video. Adult Swim also produced some incredibly slick bumpers for Evangelion around its broadcast. The first is this excellently edited advertisement that hyped up the show during commercial breaks. No, 
The Adult Swim logo on that last shot flows so well. The song featured here, I believe, is Molecularis by Amor slash Carol, but I wasn't able to find that much information on this song. The next is a bumper that aired on October 20th, 2005, that features sketches of Evangelion Unit 1, Unit 0, Gendo, Fuyutsuki, and Shinji separated between a cross with the title of the show. <laughs> Another variation of this bumper aired two days later, with the same general design but a different color palette. Both of these bumpers featured a song Last Jungle by Chris Winland. Last of all aired on September 25th in anticipation of the series premiere, and featured a puzzle of Unit 1 being slowly pieced together. <laughs> This featured a song, Psy Fidelity, by Colin Baldry. Now, to cap this off, I want to focus on some ways that Evangelion was distributed that weren't through broadcast television but weren't on DVD either. I was split between tacking this onto the end of the ADV section or including it here with Evangelion on TV, but I didn't want to make the section on ADV drag on too long. So consider this a broader definition of TV that includes things like your cable box. In 2002, ADV launched a subdivision known as the Anime Network. This was both a channel offered through cable and a video on demand service that hosted many of ADV's anime properties they held in the 2000s. Included in this, of course, was Neon Genesis Evangelion, which was one of the series offered to watch on demand. Although I could find confirmation of Evangelion available through that service, I couldn't find anything to back up whether it aired on the network when it operated as a 24-hour channel. Okay, I'm recording this while I'm editing because I just feel like I shouldn't just put an asterisk here. I should actually like, you know, like edit in that this is a thing. But while I was looking for B-roll footage for this video, I found uh, something uploaded by the director of programming at Anime Network. It was like a bunch of bumpers and stuff. And within that was a bumper that was like coming up next, Evangelion. So Evangelion did air on the 24 hour channel as well as Naughty of the Secret of Blue Water and Azumanga Daio, which is just insane to me to think that Azumanga Daio aired on network television in America. In fact, I could hardly find anything about the anime network altogether, so it's entirely possible that Evangelion had a larger presence on the network that I just don't know about. Documentation was surprisingly scarce on this, and although it's still active today, it appears that it's changed hands multiple times and has obviously lost the Evangelion license. Now, depending on your definition of streaming service, and if that includes video on demand channels, there could be an argument to be made that this was actually the first time Evangelion was available to stream in America, not on Netflix. I would hereby like to apologize to my friend who I accused of gaslighting me two years ago when he said there was a place you could watch Evangelion like this in the 2000s. It wasn't exactly like he thought it was because he said it was through Spike TV, I have no idea where he got that from. But I falsely accused you, and I treated you too harshly, and for that, I apologize. There were later services made that allowed you to pay for the Anime Network individually, which seems to add to the case that it's streaming, but it's definitely not streaming as we've come to define it today. Another remarkably interesting tidbit is that ADV seemed to have added Evangelion to multiple digital storefronts. It was available to buy on the PlayStation Network Store for PS3 and PSP, on Xbox Live Marketplace for Xbox 360, and possibly available on Android and iTunes as ADV were releasing anime on those platforms as well. I don't think that counts as streaming, obviously, but it's another way that people were able to watch Evangelion without traditional VHS tapes and DVDs. Sadly, definitive information on all of this has been lost at a cease of time. I wasn't able to find much documentation on anything here, so I'll say it again. If you know more than I was able to find or experience any of this firsthand, please leave a comment or get in contact with me. Let's shift gears. Everything we've talked about so far has been relevant to Neon Genesis Evangelion, the series. But there's still a missing piece to this entire narrative we've yet to cover, and that is the end of Evangelion, the masterwork of Hideaki Anno and his team at Gainax, still remembered today as one of the greatest pieces of Japanese animation to ever be put to the silver screen. How would this masterpiece be brought overseas to be enjoyed by American audiences? 
I'm sure nothing could go too wrong with it. Let's get this out of the way right now. All of my opinions about the dubs and the DVDs and the production shit that I'm talking about were not things I experienced firsthand. For that reason, my opinions are made with the luxury of hindsight. My incentive to make this video was there was not a comprehensive database of information on what I viewed as an important part of Evangelion's history. The issue is that I'm writing this video as someone who doesn't have the cultural context to criticize something like the end of Evangelion DVD against the 2002 anime landscape. But I'm gonna do it anyways. I'll say it again, all opinions expressed by me are wholly individual to me and are not something that I'm trying to present as objective fact. I'll try to make it clear why I'm criticizing manga entertainment when we get to that, but I just want to warn anyone who's made it this far. As Misato would say, search for your opinions yourself, and when you found your own opinions, come back to the comments and call me a bitch for having a different one. I'm sure she said that. As stated earlier, the end of Evangelion and Death and Rebirth were not part of the licensing deal that ADB had signed in 1995. When it came time to bring those films to America, ADB declined to spend the enormous $2 million to bring the movies overseas. That honor would go to a company named Manga Entertainment, who acquired the rights in 1999. Along with the announcement of their releases that September, they announced that the ADV cast would be returning to dub the films through being individually contacted, separated from ADV. This would lead to the dub being recorded in three different locations, Houston, Texas, New York City, New York, and Los Angeles, California. The releases had a troubled production, being delayed as Manga waited on Gainax to provide a higher quality Japanese audio track. There were multiple bonus features that were announced with cautious optimism, with some of them seeming increasingly unlikely. These included an interview and commentary track with Kazuo Suramaki that was never made, an interview with Tiffany Grant that was never made, and an interview with Hideaki Anno that Manga Entertainment acknowledged would probably never be made that was never made. The one extra promise that did seem to make it into the releases was an English version of the Red Cross book, a promotional pamphlet distributed with a Japanese theatrical showing of End of Evangelion that contained information about in-universe concepts. Manga also had initially announced a theatrical run for the films in America, an announcement that would later be cancelled as Manga decided to only screen the film at conventions and some art house cinemas. The cast for the dub would be contracted through a company founded by Amanda Wynn Lee, the voice of Ray of the ADV dub, named Gaijin Productions. Amanda Wynn Lee would also be the director for the end of Evangelion dub and reinterpret the translation into an English script. All of this culminated in 2002 with the release of Neon Genesis Evangelion Death and Rebirth and The End of Evangelion on DVD and VHS. Death and Rebirth was released first on July 30th, 2002, with The End of Evangelion following shortly after on September 24th. Both releases would cost you $29.95, totaling to $59.90 for both films. Additionally, on July 26, 2005, Manga would later release the two films bundled together in a slipcase with a postcard and a mousepad for $49.98, although the actual contents of the discs are uniform across the releases. Now, this is where I would start discussing the other elements of the release, such as the extras and the dub itself, but before we can really get into any of that, I have to explain aspect ratios. There are two aspect ratios that are typically used when you're watching a movie or a TV show. I know there are more than that, but for the sake of this exercise, we're going to be focusing on these two. 16 by 9 is a standard widescreen aspect ratio that you're likely to have on your television or monitor, covering up the entire space of the screen. The video that you're watching right now is in 16 by 9. 4 by 3 is the aspect ratio that was used on things like CRT televisions that most older TV shows, like Neon Genesis Evangelion, were made in. If you look at this video right now, you can see that on the sides of the 4x3 image, there's a large amount of unused space on the 16x9 display. Now, as the transition was being made from 4x3 displays to 16x9, there was a question of how to make films viewable in both aspect ratios. In the past, DVDs and broadcast television would use a process known as pan and scan to crop films with wider aspect ratios to fill up the entire space of the 4x3 screen. But with a shift to widescreen displays, that was no longer needed. This led to the development of anamorphic widescreen that would allow DVDs to display films in both 16x9 and 4x3. In 16x9, they would take up the entire display, and in 4x3, they would fit within the space allocated. This meant unused space on the top and bottom of the 4x3 display, but it also meant less pan and scan, which was good. 
Now, the reason why I'm explaining this is there are some DVDs that had neither pan and scan nor anamorphic widescreen. This meant that the film itself was in 4x3 and the unused space on the top and bottom were baked into the video itself. The Death and Rebirth and End of Evangelion DVDs are like this, so when viewed on a 4x3 display, they look like this. And when viewed on a 16x9 display, they look like this. Boy, I sure hope someone got fired for that blunder. But it doesn't end there. These releases also have absolutely atrocious video quality. The contrast is way too high on everything, meaning during scenes with brighter colors, such as when Giant Naked Ray is on screen, details blend together and become hard to make out. Everything is pixelated and blurry, the DVD is interlaced, so during scenes with a lot of movement, you can see distorted lines. If you've ever wondered what it's like to watch End of Evangelion on a PS2 texture, buddy, I have the DVD for you. The visuals here are atrocious, and yes, I know it's unfair for me to hold a DVD from 2002 to the standards of a Blu-ray from 2015, but in Japan, this movie got re-released one year later in infinitely better quality, with de-interlaced video and anamorphic widescreen. The Death and Rebirth DVD was two-sided, something that you rarely see with DVDs nowadays. The first side, named Alpha, had just a film, while the second side, Omega, had these obnoxious-ass menus that pop up that allow you to read explanations on any universe concepts. This was the Red Cross book thing I was talking about earlier. Obviously, a two-sided disc can't have any disc art, because you need to be able to put data on both sides. The End of Evangelion DVD isn't two-sided, and it just operates like a normal disc, but since Manga Entertainment wanted to have consistency or something, there is still zero disc art on the End of Evangelion DVD. The silver lining is that both of these releases come with posters, which I appreciate. I've actually picked up these for super cheap at secondhand stores just to pocket the poster and then sell the rest of it. Actually, when I first got really into A Evangelion, I used to frequent a few places I lived next to constantly to try to find this end of Ava. Most people would just torrent a movie because it was completely out of print, but I was young and I didn't understand how any of that worked. So if I wanted to watch this movie, I either had to find a DVD, watch it on some crappy re-upload site like his anime that was constantly shoving porn ads down my throat, or bug my dad to let me use his PS3 yes. media server that he had filled with torrented anime and horror films. So eventually I found this for $30, and I begged my dad to buy it for me because I was 12 or 13 and I had no money. I went home, popped it in, and lo and behold, it looked like absolute garbage. I ended up going on eBay and begging my dad like the little shit child I was to buy me one of those bootleg DVDs. I'll put an image of the one I had up on the screen. My dad probably still has this somewhere. These used to be super prevalent, and guess what? It looked infinitely better than what Manga Entertainment put out. A bootleg DVD that crammed two movies onto one disc had better video quality than something a professional company with the license had released. I'm being really harsh here, and I have to assume that something happened behind the scenes to lead to this, but Jesus Christ. I heard it speculated somewhere that Gainax forced manga to match the quality of their 1999 Japanese release, but I don't think that's true. The thought process behind that would be to circumvent reverse importation, but remember, ADB was releasing their tapes of Evangelion episodes before they were out on VHS in Japan. Also, this would make more sense if the video on the 1999 DVD was the same as the manga entertainment one, but it's not. The 1999 DVD is still non-anamorphic, but it's also fucking deinterlaced! Jesus Christ, I am so mad over 19-year-old anime DVDs that are completely obsolete. The rage that has been building inside me ever since I popped that $30 purchase in a DVD player has finally reached a boiling point. I'm sure 12-year-old me is finally vindicated, and my therapist is incredibly pleased he doesn't have to hear about this anymore. With all of that finished, let's get into the dub. I want to restate what I said before when I covered the ADV one. I don't have the knowledge of Japanese to criticize how faithful the translation for End of Evangelion is. There are plenty of other videos and resources that cover specific discrepancies. I'll once again plug the mistranslation of Evangelion by Gojesus. But I generally want to stay away from talking about something I have no way of thoroughly researching. However, there is one mistake in the script that I want to cover that I personally think has dire consequences. 22 minutes and 28 seconds into the end of Evangelion Manga Entertainment DVD, Misato says to Shinji, 
Mankind was spawned from a being called Lilith, just like Adam was. We are the 18th angel. This serves as both Shinji and a viewer's explanation as to the true identity and purpose of Adam and Lilith. The problem is it's wrong. The way that the line is worded implies that Lilith birthed Adam and mankind. This is incorrect, as Adam is a separate entity that spawned the 3rd through 17th angels. Basically, Adam and Lilith are both seeds of life that were sent out by the first ancestral race to spread their species across the galaxy and prevent their extinction, but they had this arbitrary rule that only one seed of life could be on a planet, but they messed up and both Adam and Lilith ended up on Earth and it was a whole thing. To be completely fair, none of this is properly explained in the series anyways, and Evangelion could still be enjoyed with zero working knowledge of this. But still, considering the show intentionally messes with the viewer's perception of Adam and Lilith, it's a massive oversight to mess it up when they finally explain who they are. There are also some strange choices when it comes to the pronunciation of certain words. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this dub was written and directed by Amanda Wynn Lee, who is the voice of Rey in the ADV dub and even directed a few episodes. So the choice to suddenly shift pronunciation is incredibly strange. The one that pops out the most is how the word Ava is pronounced. In the ADV dub and later in a Netflix dub, the word is pronounced as Ava or Evangelion. Ava launch! Is that an Ava? But now the Ava is removing the web that binds it to our will. But for some reason, in only the manga entertainment dub, it's pronounced Eva or Evangelion. What's going to happen to Nerve and the Evas? I want you to destroy the rest of the Eva series. I can understand how someone could get Eva, but in the trailer that Manga Entertainment produced for the movie, they get it even worse. They say, Eva. With a host of Evas under their direct command. They also somehow managed to pronounce Sele as Sela. The military might of a Sela organization. Honestly, I could have gotten Seelie, but I have no idea how the hell you could get Sela. Absolutely the strangest choice in pronunciation comes from Karu. Karu's name is of course pronounced Karu, as most people would reasonably be able to surmise. For some absolutely baffling reason, in the manga entertainment dub, his name is pronounced Kwaru. I am Kwaru. Kwaru Nagisa. Call me Quaru. Quaru, as in quack or quagmire. I'm not Quaru. I'm my own original character, Quaru. There's one other change the manga entertainment dub makes that I really want to talk about, but it comes somewhere that you probably wouldn't expect. I definitely didn't notice it when I first watched the film dubbed as a kid, and it wasn't brought to my attention until researching for this video. I think it's important to be clear on how great the sound design in End of Evangelion is. Everything has impact. The clashes of the weapons, the violent cracking of the mass production Ava's bodies, the explosions of Sele's raid on the Geoclone, the ethereal sounds created by the surreal landscape in the second half of the film. It's all fantastic. In fact, I've prepared a little supercut of the great sound effects in this movie to really hammer this point home. Now, you'd figure that something like this you would not want to change. Anyways, let's play a game of Spot the Difference. This is a clip of the original Japanese audio track during the scene where Misato is saving Shinji from being killed during the raid on the Geofront. <laughs> Now, here is the same scene as it was in the dub that Manga Entertainment produced. Hey, no offense taken. Did you notice a difference there? 
the manga entertainment dub actually adds in sound effects that weren't in the original film. The original film being anime masterpiece The End of Evangelion, praised as one of the greatest achievements in its medium. The greatest achievements being the way all of its moving parts come together to create a cohesive one-of-a-kind emotional experience. The moving parts being the art direction, the animation itself, the script, the voice acting, the soundtrack, and the sound design. The sound design being something that was intentionally changed to add in cartoon squish sounds. Boy, I sure hope someone got fired for that blunder. Now, I know this is A, something subjective that not everyone would see as a big deal, and B, literally one second out of an 80 minute film. Well, it does play later along also. But the reason why I see this as such an egregious thing is respect. The End of Evangelion is a film that, even if you disagree with me and don't think of as a masterpiece, was made by extremely talented, hardworking people. It's not anyone else's place to Star Wars Special Edition it. Even if it's so subtle I didn't notice it as a kid, because, you know, artistic integrity. Once again, we added some sound to that to make it just juicy and popping and disgusting. All for you, the consumer. Again, I'll restate what I've been trying to hammer home. My personal opinion, feel free to disagree, this video is a mix of objectivity and not objectivity. I have no doubt the people working on this release were people passionate about the film, and were trying to do the best job possible. But, as an Evangelion lecturer that's also passionate about the film, I have a different stance on things. Hey, so I'm recording this as I'm editing because I realized I forgot to put this in the script. So I'm sorry if this comes out kind of like rambly or whatever, but there's another thing the Monka Entertainment DVD does that I completely forgot to mention, which is the fact that it adds in a credit sequence after the final scene, which is baffling because there's already a credit sequence in the movie halfway through. It acts as like the barrier of what, uh, what is corresponding to the events in episode 24 and what's corresponding to the events in episode 25, but then Manga Entertainment felt the need to go add in another credit sequence, which, you know, okay, yeah, it's in English, but you could have just added English subtitles, and it just, it completely ruins the entire flow of the movie. It, it, it fucking is like trample, it, again, it's like trampling over this piece of art and completely throwing away all the artistic intention that it had. Manga Entertainment did try to remedy the issues with the video quality itself by announcing a release of the higher quality Japanese DVD in July 2006. They gave a projected release date of sometime in 2007 if things go smoothly, that came and went with no further updates and no better DVD. Finally, in November 2009, Manga Entertainment announced that they had lost a license to the two films. The dream was dead, for another decade that is. It's disappointing to see something that's my and many others' favorite film butchered like this. Hopefully, this movie has better things on the horizon. But now, let's transition once again to something different. Somewhat of a side story in the mythos of Evangelion licensing that has less to do with localizing old content and more about creating something new. The story of the never-made Hollywood Evangelion film and the project's descent into nothingness. So, another interesting tidbit about the Death and Rebirth DVD is that it has an intermission baked into the middle of it. Like, it's in the film. You, you just five minutes of just like a screen counting down. Which you would usually think, oh yeah, you'd remove that on a DVD. And, and I want to establish, I don't think this one is Manga Entertainment's fault. I think that this is on Gainax. I think, you know, they were probably like, oh, you have to have the exact movie. And we have this dumb intermission in the middle of it. But on Gainax's part, it, it, it's completely stupid to have that intermission. Because right before the intermission, there's a credit sequence in Evangelion Death. And Evangelion Death and Rebirth is like only 80 minutes altogether. So you have a really decent portion of this film, like almost 10 minutes, made up of credits and intermission. So like, why, why would you do that? What, what is the point? What do you gain? 
And then, why would you leave it on the DVDs so that people fiddling with it would have to, like, awkwardly, like, oh, I have to skip, what, what timestamp do I go to? It's like, if I had a YouTube video that's not even that long compared to other YouTube videos, and I inserted an intermission in the middle of it as some dumb meta joke, it's not funny, it's stupid, why would anyone do that? Anyways, it's just... And, and the thing is, it's like, Ava End of Evangelion, End of Evangelion has a credit sequence in the middle of it, but that's a credit sequence, and again, that's air, that, that's there for artistic intention. So it's just stupid, it's just stupid. Anyway, back to the video, it's stupid. The time is February 2003, and Evangelion is quite the hot license in America. It was hitting Cartoon Network that very month, and due to release a bunch of new DVDs the following year. Behind closed doors, ADV and Gainax were signing an agreement that would grant the Houston company the rights to create new works using the Evangelion license. To quote the exact document, it allowed for the possible development, production, financing, and exploitation of at least three live-action theatrical motion pictures, five television programs, and three direct-to-video movie products. The plan was simple. ADV was going to bring Evangelion to Hollywood. Four months later, at the 2003 Cannes Film Festival, an official announcement was issued revealing the project to be an American theatrical remake of Neon Genesis Evangelion. It was proposed as a three-way collaborative project between ADV Films, Gainax, and Weta Workshop, a New Zealand-based effects company owned by Peter Jackson, and known for work on the Lord of the Rings trilogy. John Ledford, the CEO of ADV Films, was quoted saying, The three main players here represent something of a dream team for a project like this. Between the quality and significance of Gainax, Weta's industry-leading skill in visual effects, and our expertise in the marketing and promotion of anime and anime-related content, this project is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. In the same initial announcement reported on by Variety, Ledford said the project was to have an aggressive timetable, a statement that would come to be incredibly ironic. I'd also like to point out that this Variety article doesn't refer to the series as Neon Genesis Evangelion, Evangelion, or Neon Genesis, it's just Genesis. Who calls the series just Genesis? You might as well just call it Neon at that point. News would go cold for a period of time after this, with little new information being revealed by ADV, Gainax, or Weta Workshop. That would be until December 2005, when CNN Money would report on ADV with an article titled, It's Profit Mon. In this interview, John Ledford told CNN that he had acquired half of the estimated 100 to 150 million needed to finance the production. Additionally, Weta Workshop revealed that they received more fan emails about Evangelion than Lord of the Rings, movies that had already been released. The ratio was 25 to 1. One year later, at the Pittsburgh anime convention TakoshoCon, Matt Greenfield and Tiffany Grant would answer many questions fans had about the project and reveal tons of new information. First of all, it turned out that ADV hadn't approached Weta Workshop about the project, but it had actually been the other way around. After Weta had finished their work on the Lord of the Rings trilogy, they found themselves with a large amount of infrastructure and no project to invest it in. Because of this, they pursued the Evangelion film immediately as to prevent layoffs and not let anything go to waste. Evangelion was chosen because the employees at Weta Workshop were just fans of the series and saw potential to craft a film out of the property. Sadly, it hit a snag when the company owner Peter Jackson had his dream project greenlit, the 2005 adaptation of King Kong. The Evangelion film was put on ice until work was finished on that, with it being the priority with no time to invest in anything else. After Kong was finished though, Weta Workshop looked back at the two potential film projects to move forward with, Neon Genesis Evangelion and Halo. Weta Workshop at the time chose to go ahead with the Halo project first, although they were still committed to Evangelion and were working on it. Weta's Halo project would meet the same fate as the live-action Evangelion one, with it never truly being able to make it off the ground and reach completion. John Ledford, Gainax, and Weta Workshop all held a meeting and reached a decision to not pitch the Evangelion film as a standalone project, but instead as a trilogy. 
In my opinion, this was a great choice, as it seems like it would be impossible to fit the entire Evangelion narrative into a single film, without completely butchering the story. Still, they confirmed a trilogy would have to remove and rewrite certain characters in order to adapt a three-movie format. According to this panel, three A-list directors had approached Weta Workshop and ADV about signing on to the project, all three of which apparently being huge Evangelion fans. We don't know who these directors are because of contracts and NDAs and all of that kind of thing, so it's hard to know just how influential they were. Also, an early rudimentary script had been written by a well-known sci-fi screenplay writer, but it was planned to be rewritten when the director was chosen. Again, contracts and NDAs and all of that, so we don't know who this screenplay writer is. ADV was hyping them up though, with this project supposedly finding really good footing. A pitch package had been put together, frontline with the late Robin Williams who's pretty well known for being an anime fan. He actually managed to sneak an Evangelion figure into a film he was in called One Hour Photo. According to this little shit, the mass production Evangelion is a- Well, he's a good guy, he can fly, and he has a silver sword that can kill bad guys. Wow, this asshole is either a Sele asset or really likes Rey. Also, Robin Williams says Evangelion. Neon Genesis Evangelion. Wow. So you got a guy who can't even say the goddamn name right to pitch the movie. Back on topic, other details, such as a cast, hadn't been hammered out yet, with ADV and Weta wanting to find actors who fit with the age of the main three Ava pilots. After those casting choices had been made, they would find the rest of their actors accordingly, with people who meshed well with their Shinji Asuka and Rei. Hideaki Anno had actually chosen Emma Watson as his dream pick for Asuka, but she aged out of the role come 2006. Matt Greenfield said that they had expected to sign a director by the end of the year, something that obviously hadn't happened. The project would continue to dwindle, with little information being revealed except for one interesting batch of things. Remember back 6,958 words into the script when I mentioned those bonus features on the ADV Director's Cut DVDs relating to the live action film, and I said, we'd get to that later, which I'm going to have to give a massive, we'll get to that later. Well, right now is that later. Resurrection contained an interview with employees at Weta Workshop discussing their plans for the film, along with showing multiple pieces of concept art that had been produced for the project. Genesis Reborn contains a gallery of that aforementioned concept art. We're going to be shifting into opinion territory, and my opinion is not one of positivity. Most of this concept art doesn't really capture the tone or aesthetic of Evangelion, and in some cases seems to miss the point entirely. Take this concept art for Evangelion Unit 1, for example. I apologize for the low quality on these images. I wasn't able to find any copies that looked any better than this, so this will just have to make do. Obviously, if you've watched the series, you would know that the Evangelions are not actually robots, but instead organic offshoots of Adam. They're living, breathing creatures, and this concept art does seem to capture that with a more organic, monsterish look. The issue is that the reason that the reveal of the Evangelions as uncontrollable beasts has that impact is you wouldn't be able to deduct it from their design. What the viewer originally identifies as a mecha is revealed to be armor for the creature inside. The horror of the nerve staff realizing what the Evangelion is, is horror because they sincerely didn't know. That's lost in these designs, as they're wearing their true identity on their sleeves. There are many other pieces of concept art for Tokyo 3, The Angels, and Inside the Geofront. Except, they aren't called that. Tokyo 3 is New City. The Geofront is the Nerve Command Center. And the Angel Romuel is now Cube Angel. However, this all pales in comparison to the incredibly disturbing, bone-chilling bastardization of the Evangelion characters. I'm going to read off some names to you. Asuka Langley Soryu, Rei Ayanami, Misato Katsuragi. These are all good names. Their last names originate from Japanese warships, a running theme of the names of Evangelion characters. Langley is derived from an American warship, making her name a combination of American and Japanese origin. Asuka is a character that is part Japanese and part American. 
The names Asuka and Misato are both borrowed from different manga. Rei was named after Rei from Sailor Moon, as an attempt to get Kunihiku Ukahara to join the staff of the show, which didn't Ray, work. Thanks for letting me hang with you. I admire you so much. You're everything I ever dreamed I could be. You're beautiful and smart. All of these characters' names are ingrained in both the show's viewer base and its production. So, of course, the obvious course of action would be to completely change them. Asuka Langley Soryu is now Kate Rose. Ray is now Ray, spelt R A Y. Misato Katsuragi is now Susan Whitnall. I'd have to assume the decision to change these names was a byproduct of a decision to cast these characters as white. I hope I wouldn't have to explain why this is a bad thing, but obviously this is not a choice that many people were thrilled about. I wasn't able to find any copies of these versions though, which should be a testament to the amount this damaged fans' expectations of the movie. It's also worth mentioning that Weta Workshop in this interview spoke of their hope to create the effects of this movie by seamlessly combining practical and digital methods. Alas, as I spoke of before when discussing ADV, the company liquidated its assets and consolidated into Section 23 in 2009, which I'd have to assume didn't do this project any favors. The half of 100 to 150 million that John Ledford was talking about in 2005 was capital that ADV probably didn't have to throw around anymore. Most would presume the story ends here, with no ADV to push this project forward, but they weren't done yet. In August 2011, ADV did the last thing you would figure would get a movie made, and sued Gynax. ADV. Fire in the court! <laughs> Gynax. Your opening statement. Statement. <laughs> now, this may surprise you, but I'm no lawyer, and I'll admit that it's hard to parse through all of the legal jargon here, but this is my best understanding of the case. Remember that agreement that ADV and Gynax signed all the way back in 2003? This agreement would allow ADV to pay for the rights to pitch this project to studios, and then later acquire the motion picture rights to actually produce the film. ADV paid for those development rights, which allowed them to move forward with the pre-production, but until ADV paid 10% of the $1 million fee for the motion picture rights, the project wouldn't truly get off of the ground. ADV paid this 10% in 2010, expecting to finally be able to start production. Gynax responded to this by sending back the money and telling ADV that they had changed their mind and wanted to talk over the deal again. ADV said, No bitch, this was our agreement. The rights are ours now. You can't just change your mind like this. Gynax claims that they had the ability to veto if they so pleased, and what they were doing was entirely allowed. ADV then sued Gynax to acquire these motion picture rights to finally be able to make the film. In the midst of this entire predicament, a major studio pulled from the project as ADV didn't actually have the rights to produce it at the time. I have no way of being able to say who exactly was in the wrong here, as without seeing that exact agreement that ADV and Gynax signed in 2003, it would be impossible to deduct if Gynax was actually violating it. To my knowledge, this lawsuit was never resolved for a multitude of reasons. ADV didn't even really exist in any capacity during this lawsuit, just acting as a component of Section 23 films. Gynax was a shell of its former self, slowly barreling towards its skeletal fate of selling tomatoes and not making anime. As of right now, Studio Kara holds the rights to Evangelion. Whatever negotiations would have to take place to produce this film would have to go through them, and not Gynax. For these reasons, I think it's pretty safe to say that if we do see a live-action Evangelion film, it's not going to be connected to this project in any way. I won't lie, I'm relieved to see this project never got made. I don't exactly have high hopes for a major blockbuster to be able to capture the magic of the original Evangelion series without butchering its themes and butchering its message. Weta Workshop is still in business today, doing effects for various films. They would even work on an American anime adaptation through the 2017 Ghost in the Shell film, for better or worse. 
Evangelion would still receive flashy new movies through the Rebuild Tetralogy, produced by Hideaki Anno's own animation studio named Kara. And with new films and new studios comes new licensing deals. Let's switch to the history of the Rebuild of Evangelion license in the USA and begin our loop back to that Netflix debacle. During the time when I was editing this video, my absolute greatest fear came true. A ton of information that I talked about became utterly obsolete. I'm recording this short intermission to clarify some of the things that will rear their head in the next two sections, because without it, this video is out of date on arrival. As you've likely heard by now, Amazon is planning to release Evangelion 3.0 plus 1.0 onto their Prime Video streaming service on August 13th, along with the rest of the three rebuild films. Most people figure that a new dub would be created without Funimation's involvement and with much stricter supervision, but what no one really saw coming was that new dub seeing the return of the original ADV voice cast, kind of. Spike Spencer returns as Shinji, Allison Keith returns as Misato, Tiffany Grant returns as Asuka, Amanda Winley returns as Rey, even though she was actually recast in the original Funimation dubs, and John Swayze returns as Gendo. But after that, things get interesting. Ritsuko, Mari, Kaji, and Karu have been completely recast, with actors neither from the rebuilds or the ADV dub. In the following parts, I discuss the Funimation dub and theorize on why Kara intervened and later chose to redub 3.33. I figured it was due to the unprofessional nature in which Evangelion had been dubbed and connected it to a something awful thread that seemed to tie the story together. I still stand by most of what I say in the next few sections, but I do think that Kara's issue was likely not with the voice performance of ADV or Funimation if they're choosing to bring them back now. Please keep in mind, this is a very large project Project, and I'm trying my best to put this together as factually as possible, but due to Shin Evangelion's release schedule, I'm always at the mercy of whatever information they decide to release. When I began work on this project, I had no idea the Amazon deal was going to go through. If I knew that it was, I probably would have held off on creating this until it had released, and we'd be able to know whatever things were bouncing around in Kara's head about American localization moving forward. I sincerely apologize if this video somehow becomes even more out of date after I release it, and I accept my fate of getting constant comments about how a piece of information that got released after this project was finished makes my entire video garbage and I should delete my account. Oh, but hey, this intermission does happen to make this exact word my 20,000th word written for the script. That's four times larger than the longest one I had written before. That's cool. Anyways, with all of that out of the way, enjoy the rest of the video. I'd like to give a quick disclaimer. If you can deduct the things I'm going to be discussing for the title of this section, and you're questioning its validity, don't worry about it. I'll get to that part in due time. For now, let's talk about Funimation. They stand today as one of the largest anime licensors in the American market, with their fingerprints all over countless major properties. Dragon Ball, of course, something they have their roots in, One Piece, Full Metal Alchemist, My Hero Academia, hard-hitting series with an incredibly vast reach. They even hold the license to Gainax series, like Fooly Cooly and Panty and Stocking. Within their massive catalog, they hold, held, the license to rebuild of Evangelion. It's hard to tell where Funimation lands with the rebuilds right now. As I was researching for this video, Amazon announced that they were planning to release a fourth and final rebuild film, as well as the rest of them, on streaming in August. It's unclear if Funimation has lost the license to Amazon, or if the films on Prime are merely a deal related to streaming. I'm more partial to the former being true, for reasons I'll get to. But heading back to 2008, Funimation was acquiring the license for the first time. They announced that they had acquired the rights to Evangelion 1.0 that December, valid for home entertainment, broadcast, digital, mobile, and merchandise rights to the film. Their intended release window was the following year, which actually came true this time, with the Evangelion 1.01 You Are Not Alone DVD. The official date of release was November 17th, 2009, with the DVD costing you $29.98. This release had no bonus features on the disc, but instead had a booklet included in the case with some information about the film. 
Evangelion 1.01 is a slightly recut version of the theatrical Evangelion 1.0 that featured video and audio enhancements to 266 different shots. Various members of the original ADV cast returned to reprise their roles, such as Spike Spencer as Shinji and Allison Keith as Misato. Tiffany Grant would return as Asuka in Evangelion 2.0. Surprisingly, Amanda Winley didn't return to reprise her role as Rey, due to scheduling issues. John Swayze, the actor who replaced Tristan McAvery as Gendo in the Director's Cut redub, returned to voice him in the rebuilds as well. Everyone else in the cast were new actors hired by Funimation. The English dub of Evangelion 1.0 premiered at Otakon 2009, with two showings spread across two days. Although the film seemed to have been screened in the USA earlier that year at the Santa Barbara Film Festival, and the year before at the 2008 Anime Expo, this was where the English dub was first heard. Moving forward one year, Funimation would release Evangelion 1.11 on DVD and Blu-ray on March 9th, 2010. The DVD version would once again cost you $29.98, while the Blu-ray ran you $34.98. The price tag on all future Funimation releases would be the same as this, so I'm going to refrain from restating it over and over. Evangelion 1.11 was a further improved version built off of 1.01 that featured improved brightness and added several new shots of animation. To my knowledge, this was also the first piece of Evangelion media to be put out on Blu-ray in the United States. The releases contained multiple bonus features, including small featurettes showcasing the process of making the film, and promotional music videos and trailers for the movie. Original pressings included three trailers with Fly Me to the Moon and one for Evangelion 2.0, that were all removed later seemingly for licensing reasons. Can you imagine not paying for the license to Fly Me to the Moon, that iconic song intrinsically tied to the Evangelion series? Boy, I sure hope someone doesn't let that happen again. Evangelion 2.0 premiered at the Canadian Waterloo Festival for Animated Cinema. Technically not the USA, but close enough in proximity that I'll allow it this time, with Funimation releasing it widely in theaters later that year. In fact, the first three Evangelion rebuild films received wide releases in theaters across the USA, screening at both conventions and both independent and chain cinemas. The Evangelion 2.22 DVD and Blu-ray released on March 29, 2011, featuring the 2.22 version of the second rebuild film with new and modified scenes. The bonus features on this release included a featurette showcasing the process of making the film, as Evangelion 1.11 did, alternate and deleted scenes, nine different trailers, and a commentary track recorded by the English cast of the film. Early pressings featured a slipcase, although this was later omitted. I heard that they got rid of a guidebook also, but while making this video, I bought the Blu-ray off of Amazon and the book was still inside the case, so who knows what was going on there. This brings us to Evangelion 3.0, released on November 17th, 2012 in Japan. The rollout for this film started like no other, seeing screenings spread across multiple theaters and conventions. Although the film was polarizing, people were still optimistic and awaited the DVD and Blu-ray to enjoy the movie at home. Funimation up to that point had been releasing the films in a timely fashion. This was nothing like the five-year gap for End of Evangelion and the Director's Cut episode's six-year gap. Both of the first rebuild films were released two years apart from their theatrical premiere in Japan, and saw screenings across the country before that. Funimation initially announced a release date of February 18th, 2014 for the 3.33 DVD and Blu-ray, aligning with that two-year gap for the previous films. But shortly after that announcement, a delay was issued postponing the release indefinitely, supposedly due to an overwhelming theatrical demand. And then, nothing. Time passed on and on with no 3.33 Blu-ray in sight. One year later, Funimation revealed that they were now being supervised by Hideaki Anno and Studio Kara on the release. Apparently, the subtitles were now going to be written by Kara themselves, and not the translators at Funimation. More time passed on until finally, Funimation spit out the Evangelion 3.33 Blu-ray and DVD on February 2nd, 2016, two years and six days from the initial date that they had announced. The bonus features included were a featurette looking at the process of making the film, as with the previous two, a short that was entitled Ava Extra 08, and a multitude of different trailers. 
The release came in a slipcover with a guidebook, as with Evangelion 2.22, that seems to have not been removed from print. Something people immediately noticed were the presence of two different subtitle tracks, one labeled Home Video and another labeled Theatrical. These both were, for all intents and purposes, two different interpretations of the same script. One wasn't necessarily better than the other. Both of these subtitle tracks were written by one Dan Kanemitsu, an in-house translator working at Studio Kara that's come to be somewhat of a controversial figure. We'll talk more about him later when we talk about Netflix, but for now, just know that he's the guy translating Evangelion from this point onwards. Another thing people noticed was the dub was different from what was shown in theaters initially, for better or worse. The original dub of Evangelion 3.0 is considered inaccurate to the Japanese dialogue. This was caused by a combination of trying to spice things up, a la Manga Entertainment End of Evangelion, and misinterpretation. An example of one of these changes is the line, he's not an idiot, he's a brat, to he's not an idiot, he's an asshole, which due to context could be interpreted with vastly different meanings. Asuka's relationship with Shinji is interpreted as one of raw aggression and hatred when written with words like asshole, which isn't the case. Another is the delivery of Allison Keith in the dub, being delivered in a way that led many fans to believe that Misato felt hatred for Shinji, instead of being worried about him. I can't claim to be as obsessive over every little detail in Evangelion 3.33 as the original series, so I can't speak to how deeply this affected the film, but it seemed to be prominent enough that Kara felt the need to step in. According to Tiffany Grant in a Facebook post discussing the translation process, there was a representative from Kara in the studio alongside Dan Kanemitsu, who did the translation and scripting for the redub of 3.0. They were telling us what to do, and Mike McFarlane was little more than their assistant. It's surprising to see Kara suddenly snap back and take such a direct involvement in the localization of Evangelion. After all, the original series and End of Ava didn't necessarily have the most accurate dubs either. This brings us to the section's titular tale, the Otakon Incident. I want to give an astronomical disclaimer before we get into this. When I was talking about things that I feel like I should cover but I don't have the best sources for at the beginning, this was one of those things. There is no way to absolutely verify any of the things in this story, and although I know it's shocking to imagine people going on the internet and just telling lies, that is known to happen. There are a few details in this story that are verifiably incorrect. But at the same time, if we give OP the benefit of the doubt and believe that they just genuinely made a mistake, this story fills in a lot of holes. Users online tend to spice up stories like this to make them more engaging, which can make it hard to decipher what is exactly true and false. However, this story seems to answer a lot of unresolved questions about the 3.33 and Netflix dub. Mainly, this gives us a motivation for Kara to suddenly become so hands-on with Funimation. I believe there is a nugget of truth in this story no matter what. I'll expand on these inconsistencies in a bit, but for now, let's look at a Something Awful forum post made on June 22nd, 2019. In a thread seemingly discussing the recently released Netflix Evangelion dub, user Babysitter Super Sleuth posted a story of their experience at the Baltimore anime convention Otakon, at the premiere of the Evangelion 3.0 dub. Supposedly, the entire screening was a nightmare, with the audience cheering and screaming over every line of dialogue, absolutely losing it at every turn. Particularly with Karu, a character whose romantic feelings towards Shinji are a source of much hilarity for the Evangelion fanbase. If you're wondering why this kind of thing would be entertaining enough for people to scream in a packed theater, I suggest you open up Google and search for the word Fujoshi. The post reads, Because Funimation, at its core, still has a bit of the by fans for fans ethos going on, its staff were all anime nerds, and shipping Karu and Shinji is one of the old classic ships of anime fandom. They've been handed an official work from the original creator of Evangelion, where the subtext of their relationship had been amped almost a text. So what did they do? They took the localization and pushed it even further. Every implication and hint is amplified, every joking line is up to full double entendre, and every double entendre is upgraded to full-on flirting dialogue. 
from this point on, you could barely hear the actual movie, because people were cracking up at every single line, cheering every action, and just going completely nuts. Just a loving madhouse of hooting anime nerds. It continues like that mostly through to the end. People cheer, people leave, we all put the movie out of our minds and go get drunk as you do at anime cons. OP continues to explain that within this audience of lunatic screaming otaku sat a representative from Studio Kara, who was absolutely disgusted with the reception of the film. What was intended as a serious drama was being treated like a comedy by the audience. The Kara representative returned to Japan and reported what they saw, and Kara intervened and delayed Funimation's release, forcing them to use a hyper-accurate literal translation to make sure that nothing like the Otakon screening could ever happen again. Now, let's get this out of the way right now. The Evangelion 3.0 dub did not premiere at Otakon 2013. It actually premiered two months later at the New York Comic Con on Friday, October 11th. Evangelion 3.0 did screen at Otakon, but the film was subtitled. I've seen people completely discard this testimony due to this, but I think that it's a lot more complicated. People who were at the Otakon screening verify that people did react exactly how OP described. And remember, they said that you could barely hear the movie. If you couldn't hear the movie, how could you crack up at every line? I know that's not exactly a strong argument, but still. We have footage from what is likely the New York Comic Con premiere, and a reaction that's completely accurate to the story. This is great. I like playing music with you. <laughs> you may be asking why I'm using this all together, even if it's partially incorrect. Don't you have journalistic integrity, internet user Pokemon Crystal Pepsi? I think that even if OP was just LARPing, which they very well may be, they completely hit the nail on the head with why Kara intervened now. They probably saw the reaction to the dub and the overall takeaway from the movie being Karu is gay LMAO and figured that was caused by the translation. Whether that Kara was at Otakon, New York Comic Con, or any other of the countless screenings is beside the overall point. What I believe the takeaway from OP's post and the entire release cycle of Evangelion 3.33 should be is come 2016, Kara cared about Evangelion in the USA. I believe it's also worth mentioning that I was able to find a post on Reset Era that referenced a similar reason for the redub as to the Something Awful user that was posted a day before. No mentions of Otakon specifically, but this is the earliest mention I could find of the reaction to Karu causing the intervention. Additionally, Tiffany Grant's Facebook comment about the redub of 3.33 was made after the Otakon Something Awful post was made. My initial suspicion was the post was just piggybacking off of statements made by the people at Funimation, but I couldn't find anything said before the post was written. If I'm wrong and you know something, please leave a comment because I'd be interested in trying to get to the bottom of this case. I found something referencing a post made by Tiffany Grant about the redub that wasn't the one I quoted before, but the link was dead and I couldn't find any other mirrors. Another tidbit is the time when Kara seems to have gained full ownership over the Evangelion intellectual property seems to coincide with when they intervened with the 3.33 dub, so it's possible that that could factor into this also. For now, I'm going to have to consider this story inconclusive. The reason I still chose to bring it up again is I do believe the reaction to Evangelion 3.33 in the USA was a huge reason why Kara has become so hands-on in recent years. Before this point, Evangelion was at the whim of whatever license holder happened to acquire it at the time. Remember that the ADV dub and the Manga Entertainment dub were widely not considered accurate to the source material. This could very likely be the straw that broke the camel's back. Also, keep in mind that the biggest glaring localization change in the Netflix dub had to do with Karu, supposedly what even spurred on Kara to do anything in the first place. As we approach the final stop in our journey, let's recap on how things have gone. ADV is founded in 1992 by John Ledford and Matt Greenfield in the city of Houston, Texas. They negotiate and acquire the rights to Evangelion before the series picks up steam in Japan. They dub and release episodes as they get them, leading to a turbulent production process for the voice actors. ADV passes on the rights to End of Evangelion and Death and Rebirth, which are instead released by Manga Entertainment in dubious quality with dubious editing choices. 
While manga releases two Evangelion films, ADV attempts to produce three of their own with Weta Workshop. Evangelion airs on PBS, Cartoon Network, and Adult Swim. Funimation acquires the rebuilds, ADV dissolves, and its reanimated corpse tries to sue the also reanimated corpse of Gainax. ADV loses the rights, Manga Entertainment loses the rights, Gainax loses the rights, and Funimation is forced to redub the third rebuild. We now stand in the year of 2018, 23 years from when Neon Genesis Evangelion premiered, and 7 years from when it last legally sold. On the cold night of November 26th, I had just finished a rewatch of Neon Genesis Evangelion on my Platinum Holiday Edition DVDs. I had binged the entire series with my only friend in high school at the time, a 5 foot taller than me wannabe philosopher, soon to be drug dealer, who recorded amateur wrestling matches with me in his garage, and agreed to watch the series as long as I would also watch all of Gurren Lagann. Let the fact that I can exactly recount the circumstances under which I watched the show I've seen countless times speak for how much I love that series. A series that I had accepted to be lost to the bowels of licensing hell. I sat on my couch, opened my phone, looked at Twitter, checked the newest tweets, and Good lord, what is happening in there? Neon Genesis Evangelion, in this time of year, at this time of day, in this part of the world, localized entirely on Netflix. Yes. Man, shit. No. Truth be told, this was probably the last thing anyone was expecting. After being scarce for years at this point, with DVD prices rising to exuberant heights, Evangelion would now be available on one of the biggest streaming services. Not only did this apply to the United States, but this applied to the whole damn world. Three years prior, Japan had received a fancy Blu-ray set that gave the series a new coat of paint, and now everyone would be able to legally enjoy it. For me and many others, this was a dream come true. The days of non-anamorphic interlaced overpriced collectible DVDs were finally behind us once and for all. Netflix had single-handedly put an end to Neon Genesis Evangelion's bout in licensing purgatory. But wait, would it have the ADV dub? Would they be recording an entirely new one? Would the new one have old actors or would Netflix bring in their own cast? What about new subtitles? Would they use a perfect translation, the platinum ones? Would we finally get a more accurate end of Evangelion? None of these things were known at this point, but everyone figured that there was no way things could get any worse, because we were finally getting Neon Genesis Evangelion re-released in the United States! <laughs> Anyways, let's move forward to March 22nd, 2019 when things got worse. Netflix hyped up and premiered a shockingly short dubstep-laden trailer revealing the official release date of Evangelion to be June 21st. What's funny about this is that Netflix had said it was coming out in spring back in November, and June 21st was exactly the first day of summer. Netflix missed their target release window by literally one day. And then June came around. I touched on this shit show at the beginning of the video, but I think it's worth delving deeper into the specific faults of the version on Netflix. I'm not going to be using the lack of the ADV dub as a criticism, as I think it's unfair to the cast brought in. They absolutely tried their best with the material they were given. I haven't seen the Netflix dub in full, so I can't speak too much on its overall voice performance, but I've been impressed with what I've seen. Anyways, certain grammatical errors plague the series particularly with the term third child. In Evangelion, Rei, Asuka, and Shinji are referred to as the first, second, and third children, respectively. I am like you. One of the selected children, the fifth child. You're the fifth child? But due to an oversight in the translation process on Netflix, they're referred to as the first, second, and third children. Like you, I'm a child whose path has been set out. I'm the fifth children. The fifth children? So repeatedly, in both the subtitles and the dub, characters will incorrectly refer to Shinji as the third children, plural. The credit song, Fly Me to the Moon, is completely absent across the entire series, instead being replaced by a version of Ray 1 that, to my knowledge, was created specifically to replace the credits. 
I thought maybe it was Crime of Innocence off of the third soundtrack, but the version on Netflix sounds way too fast for it to be a match. That's beside the point though. How could you replace Fly Me to the Moon in Neon Genesis Evangelion? To be completely fair, this doesn't actually affect the contents of the show itself, but still, this is a pretty egregious omission. It's likely Netflix which is to blame for this rather than Kara, because I'd have to assume the licensing process for Fly Me to the Moon would be delegated to them. Evangelion released the same year as Netflix paying $100 million to license Friends. That's 33 times the $3 million amount Netflix is estimated to have paid for Evangelion. Netflix's total assets are estimated at $40 billion, which is 13,333 times the $3 million amount Netflix is estimated to have paid for Evangelion. I think I'm bad at math. My point is that the assholes at Netflix could have afforded to pay for Fly Me to the Fucking Moon. Another baffling change on the Netflix version are the titles of the episodes. You might have noticed that the episode names between the ADV and Netflix versions are not the same. This is because the episodes of Evangelion have both different English and Japanese titles. According to an interview I read with the in-house translator at Gainax in the 90s, this was a choice by Ono as an homage to the wildly different Japanese titles to episodes of foreign shows he watched as a child. It's baffling to see Netflix discard the already translated English titles to the episodes that appear in English during the title screens, unless this was a decision by Kara, which is equally baffling to me. The subtitle script to End of Evangelion makes the same mistake as the manga entertainment version with Adam, reading, like Adam, we humans also come from a source of life called Lilith. What's even more confusing is the dub script doesn't make this mistake and correctly says that Lilith is like Adam, not that Lilith birthed Adam. Listen carefully to what I'm about to say next, Shinji. We humans came from a source of life called Lilith, which is also like Adam. That makes us the 18th angel. The dub script said third children, but it made sure to fix that mistake with Adam and Lilith. There are some other things that people contested. There were quite a few accusations of the dialogue being devoid of any emotion. I can understand that. I'm personally not a fan of Shinji saying I'm the lowest of the lows after violating a comatose girl. It doesn't really seem to encapsulate that moment like the manga entertainment version. But all of this absolutely pales in comparison to the way that the Netflix translation handled Karu and Shinji's relationship. Nine minutes into episode 24 of Neon Genesis Evangelion, a scene plays out of Shinji and Karu talking in the bath. In this scene, Karu, after giving a spiel about life or whatever the hell he was on about, declares his affection to Shinji. In the original English dub, Karu's line is translated as, Yes, and worth earning my empathy. Empathy? I'm saying I love you. In the same scene, years later on Netflix, the translation is changed. In the Netflix English dub, Karu's line is translated as, Yes, you're worthy of my grace. Your grace? I'm saying I like you. This was interpreted by most people, me included, as an attempt to erase a gay romance between Shinji and Karu. But let's dissect this a bit. My pedantic analysis should not be interpreted as me saying that I don't believe there are real romantic undertones here. I absolutely do, and I wouldn't even say they're undertones as much as they're an outright statement. I believe that the Netflix translation is incorrect here, and the word like does not encapsulate the emotions going on between Shinji and Karu. Where I start to splinter off from most people is the belief that this was an intentional move by Netflix to straightwash Neon Genesis Evangelion. A fact I don't hear brought up enough is that Netflix did not create the translation you see here. It was completely created by Studio Kara. Dan Kanemitsu, who wrote the retranslated scripts for Evangelion 3.33, is also the person who retranslated Neon Genesis and End of Evangelion, working directly for Kara as their in-house translator. He took to Twitter after the backlash to clarify his stance on the translation. While I am not in a position to refer specifically to the decision involved in the scene you described, in all of my translation of any title, I have tried my best to be faithful to the original source material. Bar none. The power of storytelling sometimes depends on the ability of audiences to establish emotional relationships with the characters, as well as recognize intimacy between people based on inferences. 
it is one thing for characters to confess their love. It is quite another for the audience to infer affection and leave them guessing. How committed are the characters? What possible misunderstandings might be taking place? Leaving room for interpretation makes things exciting. The statement that Karu and Shinji's relationship is ambiguous is incredibly controversial, but for the sake of the video, let's entertain it for a second. I want to give an enormous opinion alert right here. This is my interpretation, my fan theory, and I am not claiming this is objectively the motivation of Karu's character. I absolutely believe Karu loves Shinji, and Shinji loves him back. I also believe the translation choice on Netflix is incredibly ignorant and makes no goddamn sense. But this is what I believe Dan Kanemitsu may mean by that scene in the bath being ambiguous. Karu is not a human. He is a vessel containing the soul of Adam sent by Sele to destroy humanity. Shortly after the scene in the bath, Karu betrays Shinji and the rest of Nerve by attempting to fuse with what he believes at the time to be Adam. Upon discovering that he's fell for the old switcheroo, Karu comes to the realization that he is destined to either continue living and let humanity be destroyed, or himself be destroyed to allow humanity to continue on. Karu gives up resistance and allows Shinji to kill him, declaring that he believes Shinji is a person who deserves to live. Here's my pitch. Karu comes to the realization he genuinely loves Shinji upon finding Lilith, and his sacrifice for Shinji to continue to live is an expression of love. If Karu's feelings were to be truly genuine before stepping into central dogma, he would have been in love with someone he was planning to kill, but his feelings became real. Just like Rei, he realized that even if he wasn't human, he wasn't Sele's doll. Only one life form will evade extinction and be granted a future. And I've come to the conclusion that you shouldn't be the one to die. None of this is to say that I like you is a good translation, because it's absolutely not. Even if Karu is leading Shinji on in that scene in the bath, he's not leading him on with the emotion of like. But simultaneously, I think there is more to Karu's character than being a hopeless romantic for Shinji, and Dan Kanemitsu shouldn't be accused of being intentionally homophobic for a poor translation. I could see the thought process of Karu leading Shinji on with flimsy affection during that scene that would later on become real. However, regardless of intention, Kara and Dan Kanemitsu should still be held accountable on some front for erasing Karu's relationship with Shinji, albeit purposeful or not. I'm just saying that we have to draw a distinction between going into someone's replies and accusing them of hating gay people, and pointing out how their interpretation fails the original work. If we believe the story about the Otakon incident, it would give a good motivation for Kara to want to lean into subtlety for Karu's romance towards Shinji. But anyone who has ever had those two characters resonate with them shouldn't have to take the bullet for a bunch of nerds in a movie theater not taking something seriously enough. But even if I disagree with Dan Kanemitsu's interpretation and believe it deserves to be criticized, I don't believe from what I've seen that it's rooted in any kind of intentional discrimination, just ignorance for the source material. Likewise, ADV shouldn't be put on a pedestal when the initial VHS subtitles of Evangelion also use the word like, and repeatedly took intentional liberties to various scenes. I used to be one of those people that hailed to ADV and Funimation as the superior licensors of Evangelion, and Dan Kanemitsu as a homophobe who doesn't know anything, but in my opinion, that characterization of both parties is completely wrong. Dan Kanemitsu even did translations for ADV through Martian successor Nadesco and Gus Araki. Wow, that's the second time I've brought up Martian successor Nadesco in this video. It's not important or anything, just weird that it happened twice. Anyways, on Twitter, Dan said that he had actually tried to give Netflix a new script that fixed many of the errors that made it into the final release. However, for an unknown reason, they passed on using it. Over time, the subtitles have subtly changed in certain ways, such as the infamous line, you are worthy of my grace, being changed to, you are worthy of my affection. Recently, there was a minor controversy on Twitter when Amanda Wynn Lee made a tweet about the Netflix translation, claiming it was the same Gainax initially gave them when they started production at ADV. Her tweet reads, You know that crappy, awful script they used? They try to make us use that exact same script 25 years ago. Matt Greenfield stood up to them and told them that the script was ridiculous and to step off, we're using a script that actually makes sense. 
If only Netflix had had the balls to do that, I think the performances of the new crew would have been even more stellar. This is incorrect, as the translation used on Netflix was made specifically for this release. What she's likely talking about is what was written by Project Translator Kuni Kimura, as Dan Kanemitsu was not even working with Gainax in the 90s. This is not to say that Amanda Wynn Lee was being intentionally fictitious about the translation, but I think it's important to clarify the facts here, as Dan's response and Amanda's amendment have much less coverage than her original tweet. Kara wanted the new cast to be more subdued, and closely reflect the original Japanese voice actors, something that makes sense after seeing their experiences with Funimation and Evangelion 3.33. This is pure speculation on my part, but I have to wonder if the recasts were intentionally made to leave out the original dub voices, after bad experiences Kara had with them in the past. The decision to even redub Evangelion came from Kara themselves, who were also in control of the casting. Remember that ADV literally tried to sue Gainax, and although Gainax and Kara are two separate entities, I'd figure the spat between them wouldn't leave the best impression. The Netflix translation may be absolutely terrible in some regards, and I may believe it's much worse than the ADV Platinum translation, but it's also accurate and reflects the original series much more authentically than what the Houston company produced. The ADV dub is expressive but inaccurate. The Netflix dub is emotionless but authentic. Even if we have our own opinions, it's unfair to romanticize one or the other, because the truth is, Evangelion is just a hard show to localize. Matt Greenfield, the ADV cast, Amanda Wynn Lee, the Manga Entertainment cast, Weta Workshop, the Funimation cast, Dan Kanemitsu, and the Netflix cast are all people who didn't wake up with the intention to bastardize a work of art and ruin it for all the real fans. And for the most part, I'd argue that none of them did. They did good things, they did bad things, they did everything in between. It's human nature to mess up and then get back up and try again, and is there anything more true to the message of Evangelion than accepting something like that? Maybe the real American adaptation of Evangelion was us all along. At the 27th Tokyo International Film Festival, Hideaki Anno hosted a talk event where he spoke of his desire to bring anime overseas to a wider audience through a platform to support young animators. I plan to put English subtitles on all of the works we release. I plan to make everything to be as accessible to people all over the world. This is really a worldwide project. It's not just for people in Japan who like Japanese animation, but to allow others from all over the world who want to check out Japanese anime the chance to do so. I hope to add more diversity to Japanese animation, help it evolve through new talent and encourage more interesting anime in the years to come. I want to convey the appeal of animation as simply as possible. That project he was talking about was the Japan Animator Expo, a collaboration between Studio Kara and telecommunications company Dewango to produce and distribute independent shorts by up-and-coming animators online. One of the shorts released during its run was Me Me Me. You've probably seen this music video somewhere at some point in the past seven years, considering most re-uploads of it have at least a few million views. The comments on these videos are widely in English, and one of the top results is a version subbed in Spanish. Hideaki Anno's vision of Japanese animation as a globally appreciated art form is something that's quickly becoming a reality. For Kara's motivation to involve themselves with Evangelion in the USA, I think more important than any drama between Kara, Funimation, ADV, Netflix, or anyone else, is a desire to have a direct hand in bringing these pieces of art to people all over the world. While I was working on this video, Amazon announced that they're planning to release the final rebuild film in hundreds of countries, only five months after its premiere in Japan, an unprecedented duration of time. Remember that 1.0 and 2.0 took two years, while 3.0 took four. Even if Netflix was not the regeneration that Evangelion needed from its death in America, that doesn't mean that it still can't be rebirthed. If you got this far into the video, thank you for watching. I genuinely appreciate it because this is the kind of project I never thought I could have pulled off before. 
There are a few loose ends that I want to tie up for this video that I didn't know how to fit anywhere else. G Kids, an American anime distributor, announced back last October that they're planning to release an ultimate box set of Neon Genesis Evangelion with the two films on Blu-ray in America. We haven't heard any further news since then, and there hasn't been any statement made about whether it'll have the dub used on Netflix or the ADV dub or something entirely new. But if I had to guess, I'd figure it'll just be whatever's on Netflix. I'd love for the subtitle track to be rewritten and have certain things changed and fixed, but I'm not really holding my breath. Another region is apparently getting this box set, which I'll put up on the screen right now, that looks pretty tight, so hopefully this is the kind of thing that they're planning to put out here. They also announced that they have the theatrical rights to everything, so maybe the end of Evangelion theatrical run that Manga Entertainment originally planned for all those years ago will finally become a reality. Knowing my luck, G-Kids will announce something while I'm editing this video or right after I upload it, so if you're watching this and we just got news, you can thank me later. I also want to cover a few nuggets of information that I found that I didn't think had enough evidence to back them up to really include otherwise. The first relate to a statement made by Tristan McAvery, the original dub voice actor of Gendo who didn't return for the director's cut redub. In an interview with YouTuber Goat Jesus, he claimed that the English dub script written by Matt Greenfield was actually plagiarized from fan translations. Now, as with the Otakon incident, I have no way of verifying this, but I do consider someone directly involved with the dubbing process as someone who would have some authority to make a statement like this. If this were true, it would add to the reasons why Kara felt the need to retranslate and redub Evangelion for Netflix, and explain the mistakes that the dub makes. I also saw a story on Reddit about an incident regarding workplace homophobia directed at the voice actor for Karu, Kyle Sturdivant, supposedly written by a friend of his. This has a much more massive source needed than what Tristan McAvery said, but the statements made by the Reddit user align with the way that Tristan characterized Matt Greenfield, and would give us a clear reason why Kyle Sturdivant didn't return for the director's cut either. But if we know anything about the internet, it's that it's absolutely full of LARPers. I thought this was information that wasn't worth discarding, but should be taken with a grain of salt. Insert this into the timeline at your own discretion. Generally, all of the media formats Evangelion released on in Japan were brought over to America. But there was one that we didn't see any form of, being the UMD format for the PSP. In 2006, a box set was released including both an Evangelion RPG and the renewal version of Evangelion Death and End of Evangelion. To my knowledge, this saw no sort of release in America, although ADV did distribute the original series on the PlayStation Network. I originally envisioned this video as an overview of every time Evangelion was released on home media, but I decided that project was far too large in scope to be able to realistically make. I wanted this video to be 20 minutes when I started researching for it, and obviously I far exceeded that goal. Toonami actually aired the first two rebuilds on the block a few times. I wrote this down in my extensive notes, but I suppose it just slipped through the cracks and didn't make it into the full script. I would have recorded an amendment for it, but I was editing the Funimation part on 4 hours of sleep after being up for nearly 24 hours, so I just didn't really have the energy to talk at that point. The last thing I want to bring up is an interview with Funimation president Gen Fukunaga, where he calls out Netflix for caring less about the Evangelion license as him and his company. I don't need to really even explain why that's hilarious at this point, but the fact that he go out of his way to say this after Kara felt the need to intervene because their translation and dub were so bad, and that they wouldn't just purchase the license when it was stuck in purgatory is incredibly funny. My intention with making this video was to cover a piece of Evangelion lore that I hadn't seen compiled and documented very well. All of this information is out there, obviously, but no one had put together a video like this that uses that information to tell a story. Even in something as simple as a DVD, there can be a massive amount of history. My exposure to Evangelion was initially through the ADV dub, and after everything I've researched for this video, I found a massive appreciation for it that I didn't have before. To brush off dubs as a cheap imitation of the original work, or to undermine the emotional attachment people can have to them. 
I want to thank anyone who's ever been involved in the production of Evangelion in the USA. Even if I think they've made missteps, I can tell from listening to interviews and reading what they've said that they have a love for the series. At the end of the day, we're all just Evangelion lecturers in this crazy wacky world. I would also like to thank Ava Geeks for being an insanely good resource for various pieces of Evangelion information, Savenge's Neon Genesis Evangelion Home Video Compendium for having a disgustingly large amount of information about Evangelion's home media, and every other person who's contributed to the countless sources I read through for this video. I didn't want to be one of those YouTubers who just parroted wiki pages back to you, and I hope I accomplished that. But at the same time, I wouldn't have been able to complete a project like this without the extensive documentation created by the Evangelion community. Finally, I really want to thank anyone who has stuck with me after I promised to make content last December and then proceeded to do exactly not that. A lot of really bad things started happening in my life, and I lost motivation to go through with the 12 days of productivity. I still should have tried my best because even if I don't have very many subscribers, I still want to give them my 100%. I had initially planned to continue the 12 days of productivity in January, and then February, and then March, until the entire thing just collapsed and I couldn't do it anymore. When I had said that most of the videos were complete before, I had made that video assuming that when I uploaded it a week later, I would have made good progress. Ironically, that project killed my ability to be productive. I wrote two scripts for big comeback videos, but both of them just felt wrong, like they would just be more filler content I made without putting my heart into it. I guess I wanted to make a video like this one to prove to myself that I had the ability to make something I was really proud of. It has a lot of flaws, sure, but I still feel like this video is my largest accomplishment when it comes to content creation. Right after I'm done with this video, I'm going to launch into another one, and although I don't want to promise what I can't deliver, I'm hoping to be able to upload again within the next few months or so. Don't expect anything nearly as long as this video, because to get this done, I had to do nothing for weeks and weeks but wake up and start working on this until I went to bed. I actually got physically ill from pushing myself so hard, just sitting at a monitor recording and editing and not talking to anybody. I eventually broke and let myself take breaks so I could start watching the Pat Labor OVA. Have you guys seen the Pat Labor OVA? It's really good, although I don't like how the sixth episode ends at all. It cuts out way too abruptly and that story has zero room to breathe. It does genre parody for most of its run that's executed surprisingly well. There's a Godzilla parody that's played completely straight, which I appreciate because Godzilla is fucking awesome. It's kind of crazy to think that it's directed by the same guy who made Angel's Egg. It's just such an energetic, sweet slice of life that happens to have some really great mecha. I mean, look at this badass shit. There's this character named Kanuka Clancy, who gets introduced in the second episode. She's a foreigner from New York City who swears a shit ton. I just think it's funny this one character just casually pulls a gun on her co-workers multiple times. What, you don't care about Pat Labor? You're just here to hear me talk about Evangelion? If it's not obvious already, I'm writing this after the fact. I know that this video probably doesn't seem like it took that much effort, but if you're watching all the way to here, I hope that you enjoyed it at least. Again, I definitely feel like this is the best thing I've ever made for this channel. I know this all sounds like gibberish to you if you're watching one of my videos for the first time. And if you are, then hey, I'm Zin Buster, the biggest Kari Kano fan in the world, and I will gladly fight anyone who can test that title. If you want to perform an exercise in torture, my shitty old review videos are in a playlist unlisted on my channel. If you'd rather see me at my best, I'll hopefully catch you next time. Thank you all so much for watching. I'll see you all next video with No More Heroes 2.